sitting in our, in our seats. Uh, I just have a few announcements, a few housekeeping things for us this morning. In the interest of just kind of consolidating and streamlining the announcements, I'm just going to mostly direct your attention to the bulletin. So make sure you look through this if there's any additional details that you might need or ask one of us after the service. Uh, but first of all, I just want to say welcome. Thank you for coming to worship with us. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, if you'll do us a favor, as always, take out your connection slip. It's that little uh, pink slip in your um, bulletin and fill that out. If you have no new information, just fill out the top. And if you do have additional information, then please fill out the rest of it and hand it into the basket as you make your way forward for communion. Um, two important things. Uh, first of all, if you did not receive on Friday, we sent out a letter regarding the 2020 budget. Um, if you received that and you don't need a physical copy, um, then that's good. We're going to have some of it on the screen today. Pastor Jay is going to kind of go over that a little bit uh, in his message. Um, but just take that uh, take, take a moment, just be really mindful of that and be prayerful as we walk through that. Um, but also, there's our, connect, our commitment cards uh, that are in your bulletin from last week and this week. We told you to take it home, pray over it. Uh, if, this is, if you're just receiving it this week, then you still have another week or two to, to really pray over it. And it's not just a financial commitment, it's a spiritual commitment. You'll see both sides of that. It's really what we're looking forward to in our next steps in this stewardship drive. It's discipleship driven. It's our holistic stewardship. How can we envision all that we have and all that we are as belonging to God, and how can we use that and leverage it for the kingdom? So be mindful, be prayerful of that. Pastor Jay will also go over that in the message today. Um, but those are two important things that we're looking at. Um, also, just looking ahead, our uh, Advent night services, there's additional information for that in your bulletins. But just note that the uh, tickets will not be sold at the door. So if you're interested in coming to those, uh, we'd like to know ahead of time so that way we, we can kind of plan for enough food to have for everybody. Um, so if you're interested in our Advent night services, uh, December 4th and the 11th, uh, please get your tickets ahead of time. Also, uh, just this week, things to look ahead to is we have our Christmas, our, <laughs> we have our Thanksgiving Eve service on Wednesday at 7 with our pie social afterwards at 8. Um, be plan to join us for that. It'll be a good time. And then our Christmas Bazaar is on Saturday. So uh, with all the festivities, with uh, breakfast with Santa and everything like that. All right. And if there are no, no further announcements or anything that I have missed, I'm going to ask you to please stand as you are able. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's share God's peace one with another.
chosen and not forsaken.
to 44. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of him. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it is already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give me them something to eat. They spent, they said to him that would take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked, go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Folks, be seated. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Gracious God, we know that you are here present with us today, and we give you thanks for that. We ask your Holy Spirit, come and fill this place to be with us, to challenge us, to move us, to help us take this next step. So as we continue to talk about your kingdom, we invoke your blessing to be on each and every one of us. Your servants are listening. Speak, Lord, to our soul. Amen. All right. Thanks for being here. There were rumors that there was actually snow. Anybody see snow yet? A couple of you live up north, maybe? All right, very good. Well, I'm glad you made it anyway through all that snow. All right. Uh, so we are in the middle of what we're finished up really this weekend is Christ the King weekend. All right, we're going to lead with that. So we're going to celebrate this. Yes, is why we have the white on the paraments, and we have you know we're talking about singing songs about Christ the King. Um, but whenever you hear the word Jesus Christ today or something like that, we're just going to ask you to remember the King because that is really what we're talking about is Jesus Christ our King. And Jesus Christ our King just did this amazing miracle, right? The feeding of the five thousand. So this is a great example for us to walk through and read about. Um, when, it's, when we're really wanting to look at how special and unique Jesus Christ is, but there's a lot more to this, so we're going to jump into this. This miracle in particular, though, whether you knew, I don't know if you know, is the only one that's recorded in all four of the Gospels. Right? So there's something about this particular message, this particular miracle, that all four of our Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, felt the need to put into their own Gospels. Right? There's something about it that this miracle was able to share whatever their perspective was on Jesus. So there's really something unique about this one in particular. We are going to look at it in lieu of our discipleship. We're going to look at this in lieu of our stewardship, our holistic stewardship approach, which we've been walking through the last couple of weeks. We've reflected on it. We've looked at holistic stewardship and how that leads us into the main reason that we gather, that deep relationship with Jesus Christ, all right? the, the, the worship of our Lord and Savior, our King. But we looked at fear and anxiety as some of those things that is holding us back from this relationship a couple weeks ago. And we heard loud and clear, as long as we continue to live without a personal relationship, which can be done and still come to church, without that relationship with Jesus our King, we will continue to live in fear and anxiety and it will continue to win. All right? Last week we heard Reese proclaim to us that taking a risk is also associated with the kingdom of God and with Jesus. Um, but it's so much easier to do when we have that personal relationship, right? She challenged us to reflect in our lives what's holding us back from that holistic stewardship approach to our lives. And whether it's holding our finances back or something personal that we want to risk for God and just haven't yet. But she encouraged us all to push deeper 
and to really move our relationship forward to that next step with Jesus, our King. So we have. We've walked through the fear and anxiety and risk. All those things that really kind of keep us back from being fully immersed in this relationship with Jesus Christ. And we know we can't fully overcome them without him. All right? So this Sunday we're going to finish with seeing who Jesus is to us, how he works in our life, both as our Savior and as our friend and as our King. And we're going to look at it in light of taking this next step, as we're calling today Next Step Sunday. So that kind of gets you caught up. If you've been visiting with us, we're, we're glad you're here. Uh, we're going to kind of walk us through a few things about discipleship, and we're glad you're there. But I had a seminary professor once tell me there's a fine line between a long sermon and a hostage situation, right? <laughs> I don't, we're not going to hold you hostage, but I do want to prep you. It might be a little longer than normal, all right? Because we've got a lot to talk about what we're walking through this morning. Because we want to look at our holistic stewardship approach, and we're also looking at discipleship. We're going to dig into our personal faith journey through this discipleship and look at where we are in the life of Trinity as we look at our budget. Because as you're aware, the budgets went out, and so hopefully you've, you've seen those. And in two weeks after each worship service, we're going to approve the working budgets that we're going with. So we're going to talk about that uncomfortable thing sometimes that guides our life, and that's our finances, right, and our money. Um, but this is nothing that should be new to us. These things are a part of who we are, and if we look at all we have and all that we are given is given to us by God, then we look at that as just a natural extension of that. So we do respond then with everything we have and all that we are for the glory of God, including our lives, our families, our jobs, and yes, even our finances that we like to claim as ours. But we're first going to begin with our discipleship journey. Um, in your bulletin, you will have this. I'm going to ask you to pull this out, this little sheet. All right, it's a two-part sheet. Uh, it has a commitment card in there as well, which we'll walk through that shortly. And I don't want you to kind of read through this now, but we're going to touch base on a couple of things. But this is going to be an important piece for us to walk through in the year 2020. All right, that's kind of our 2020 vision. There, I got, got it out. I mean, it, everybody's going to use it, so everyone's going to have a 2020 vision next year, right? We might as well jump on board. But we're going to look at our faith in some very tangible and important ways that are going to engage us to take this next step in our own personal faith journey, all right, to know, grow, and reach um, our others. So the five areas that you're going to see on this thing here, and we put them up on the board for you too, just in case, we are going to walk closely with Jesus, we're going to know and live the scriptures, we're going to live and participate in community, we're going to engage those who don't know God yet, and we're going to teach others to teach others, all right? Those are the five tenets, core values, if you will, of discipleship. Okay, so each of these columns has at least four talking points. All right, I lied. There's three and teach others to teach. But there's at least a few of them we can look at and see where we are. Um, so now I want you to flip the page. All right. Here's where you get to work personally on your own relationship, your own uh, discipleship journey along those lines. So on the left-hand side, it says, where are you in your faith journey? So based on these questions on this chart, where are you on your journey? Zero to ten, along those lines. Just a self-help kind of please. All right? Where are you on a, on, on a scale of one to ten? And so let's kind of walk through this, because this is not for your spouse. This is not for your kids. This is your personal journey. So this is going to take some time for you to kind of walk through and figure out where you are with your relationship. All right? It's for you and your reflection. But on that scale of one to ten, where are you with your scripture life, let's say? So let's look at that um, under the scriptures. Know and love the scriptures. Those little pieces are, do I understand the core tenets of Christianity? Do I memorize scripture? Do I take time for personal Bible study? Those are kind of starting points for us. So then as you flip it over, then this next step under number two is knowing and living scripture on the right-hand side. We'll have beginner level class on basics of Christianity. Write a scripture verse or two on an index card. Ask church staff to help you pick it out. Or stop and pray with people at the time they ask for prayers. All right? These are starting points, faith points for us. And maybe you circle where you might be at or where you want to take that next step. And then that is what we'll put on this commitment card. Because your commitment card is the same. It's a very mirror image of this. This is for you. This is for me. All right, so you get to fill this out and work on it. Turn this one in as a commitment, not to me, I'm, you know, it's for God, so not for me. But we do want to use these as ways to maybe walk through together where we're at and where we can continue to take a next step, because that's where we're at. So throughout the year, our goal is going to be providing resources for all of these areas um, that will help us continue to take those steps deeper into our next step. But please understand, it's not a checklist. 
They're, all right, it doesn't get move us further into heaven along those lines. It's not something we do. They're simply reference points for us to help identify where we are in our own journey. And then, of course, that goal is to take the next step. Um, but we do want you to commit to that. So that is why it's on the backside of the financial pledge card as well, because we're pledging our lives to Jesus as well as some of our resources. All right? But it takes a commitment to engage in this personal relationship with Jesus Christ our Lord. Knowing that none of these disciplines matter, doesn't matter how many things you circle on there, nothing's going to matter without that surrender to Jesus Christ and the unconditional love that he's going to give for us. All right? Okay, so we've talked based on that. Now grab your Bibles if you have them in front of you or if you would like to put it on your Bible app or whatever you want to do because we're going to start walking through that message again. And maybe we've got some notes to take, take down. So the Gospel of Mark for all you Confirmation kids, Old Testament or New Testament? Okay, good. Thank you. You don't have to come next week. All right. See, if you just would have said something. All right. So New Testament, chapter 6. And we're going to begin, as we heard, uh, with verse 30. And we're going to walk through this section by section just as a way to, to help us look at this miracle in light of our discipleship and stewardship. But first we need some context. What is behind this that is set up to this point? So in the very beginning of chapter 6, if you have it open, uh, we're going to look at what was just happening prior to this. The disciples had just been sent out two by two. All right, We hear this in verse 12 and 13. Jesus sends out his disciples and they went out and they preached that people should repent. And they drove out many demons, and they anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. All right? So Jesus has just sent them out. Then we hear a brief little part about John the Baptist and his demise. All right? we, there's little ones here, so we won't talk about it. But, all right? We know what happened with him. Why that's in there in between these two things, who knows? But nonetheless. Then we jump right back into verse 30. And this is where we pick up in our readings this morning. Verse 30, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and all that they had taught. Now, if you've been around with me or if you've been in part of our meetings going forward that we're starting to do, what does that kind of sound like? Anybody do God sightings? Right? We're reporting. This is where God's active. This is where Jesus has been. We're telling each other. We're sharing with one another. Uh, recognizing. We're lifting up where Jesus has made a difference in our lives and in the lives of others. This is one of the, the commitments we're making toward any meetings or anything that we do here at Trinity. We're going to begin every meeting, everything we do, with God's sightings and prayer. All right? It keeps us focused. It helps us understand why we're here to begin with. So even budget meetings, any of these basic meetings, we just come and gather, lift up God. God's sightings and prayer. All right? So that's, that's really what the disciples are doing. They're sharing with one another how God and how Jesus has worked in their lives. All right, so jump to verse 31 then. Because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat. Disciples in that. When we're in the middle of this discipleship stuff, it can get very busy, right? Look at all the programs we do, everything that we do in our church life. It can be busy, 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 on top of everything else that's going on, all right? There is something about the busyness that is out there. But Jesus understands the busyness. So in that same part of the same verse, Jesus calls them out. He says to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Jesus knows that we can let busyness take over. All right? So in the middle of our discipleship journey, if we feel overwhelmed or we know things are too busy, he's encouraging us to go and spend some quiet time. But not just quiet time. What does he say first? Come with me. Jesus is part of that. We have to understand that when we do take time to develop that relationship with him, he is there with us, all right, to a quiet place. So quiet and resting time is very important in this relationship with Jesus Christ. All right, verse 32. So they, disciples and Jesus, went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many of them saw them leaving and recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. All right, so Jesus' disciples are in a boat. They're on their way across the thing, and people are sprinting around the lake to try and get there ahead of him, right? There's an excitement with Jesus. There's an excitement to seeing who Jesus is and where he is in our lives. And so if we aren't excited to meet Jesus, we have an opportunity to go deeper in our lives. If Jesus still hasn't made an impact in our own lives and we're not excited to wake up and praise him, we have an opportunity to go deeper. If we're not excited to come and worship Jesus, not just on Sundays, but every other day we wake up, we haven't fully surrendered to what he has to give to us. If we're not leaving out of here with a smile on our faces at a minimum, 
although it is a long message, so I get it. But when you have a deep understanding of who Jesus is in your life, you can't wait. You can't wait to chase him down and look for him in all these different places in life. You have no, no, no hope but other than to look for him. It's really an amazing piece to find him every day, everywhere. All right? So the crowd is looking for him. They are chasing him down because they expect him to do stuff. All right? So verse 34, when Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them, as he does for all of us, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and so he began teaching them many things. This is one of our steps in our discipleship approach. Right? Two weeks ago, we talked about multiplication. Multiply, multiply. From the beginning of the Adam and Eve in the garden, the first command was to go forth and multiply, to Jesus leaving, go make disciples. From cover to, it is about multiplication. We are here to save souls and make disciples. Right? So this is one of the ways that we do that. The goal of discipleship is not for us to go deeper and then stop. It's deepening our own relationship, yes, so we can go out and learn more and teach others. We can equip others to go out and walk with others that they know so they too can learn and grow and they begin to walk with others, right? That's the multiplying. That's discipleship. So Jesus began teaching them many things so they could be equipped to then go and tell as well. He's engaging those who didn't know God or maybe didn't know what he was all about and yet he was still teaching them to teach others as well. Two of our, our core tenets there. All right, verse 35. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said. It's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. On the surface, it sounds like a reasonable request. You've got a lot of people we know. Um, so what do you do? We can't take care of them all. Jesus, what are we supposed to do? There's this overwhelming sense of don't know what to do. Anxiety, maybe. How are we supposed to take care of all these people? Are we even supposed to take care of all these people? Let's just send them away and let them fend for themselves. There's really no way we can do it anyway. It seems to be hopeless. And so here's where Jesus really steps in at this point and, and gives a little bit of fun and a little bit of power and shows who he really is in this scenario. Jesus answers in verse 37, You give them something to eat. And again, they said to him, That would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and to spend that much on bread? And give it to them to eat? Man, what does that sound like? It's an overwhelming sense of scarcity, right? To protect what we have. We're assuming they have the money. They're not saying, let us go raise the money. They're saying, should we give it? And should we actually use it? So we think they had the money with them. But they didn't want to give it up, right? It's mine. It's all ours. How can we do this and take care of other people? And so in many ways, they didn't want to risk what they had for others, all right? Jesus does what Jesus does. In verse 38, well, how many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. So, again, bringing us to our discipleship piece. What do we have to work with? All right, what are the loaves in our lives? How many loaves do we have to work with? We heard the, two weeks ago the, the parable of the talents and the, the treasures. We're each given our own to our own abilities. We don't have the same, you know, same universal uh, talents and gifts. But what do we have that we can identify, that we can use as part of our loaves, all right? Where is our relationship? What is our, our, our resources? So where are you right now? Again, ask that question. And so when they found out, the disciples, they said, we have five loaves and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, and taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks, and he broke the loaves. He also gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. And he also divided the two fish among them as well. Don't know if you noticed, but in all of these verses where there's pieces that are highlighted that are, uh, are red, they were highlighted in red, there's a reason for that. Those highlighted pieces are the important parts where the disciples worked with Jesus. All right? That's the part where the disciples did the work. Jesus tells them, you give them something to eat. You go and see what we have. Direct the people to sit down. Distribute the meal to the people. See, the miracle, we get all caught up, and Jesus did this miracle, but the people participated. The disciples participated. So do we understand then, in light of this whole piece of discipleship, that we are called to be a part of what God is doing in the world? We get to act. 
So why don't we care so much about helping others? Why do we continue to make it about us when it's very clear that we're called to participate on behalf of a God who will show us what abundance really looks like and what being a disciple of Jesus, our King, looks like? We have to act. We have to participate. If we don't, we may end up, you know, flooded and, and drowned. There's that quick little story. Maybe you guys, you, most of us have heard it, right? The guys where the guys, there's a flood coming up, and the, the guys like, no, no, you know, people are sending boats, and they're sending helicopters, and sending stuff. Come on, jump in. We'll save you. We'll save you. And he goes, no, no, no. God's got us. He's going to save me, right? Well, the waters overwhelm him. He ends up in heaven and, and says, God, you know, I thought you were going to save me. I, I prayed and did all these things. Why didn't you save me? He said, well, I did. I sent you a boat. I sent you a helicopter. You know, I mean, this is the active participation piece that we have to do. We can sit and say, God's got this, yes, but we still get to act on his behalf, right? We are called to use the things that God has given us to participate in his kingdom. But besides our own personal gifts, he's also given us each other. How many times does something seem overwhelming and we refuse to see that the power of community is so important. We fail to see that when we work together, we have more than enough. And so this is where we're at in our church right now. Um, this is that awkward transition now to the budget pieces, right? We sent out the proposed budget to all of you. If you did not receive it, we just need your contact information, your email, and we can send it right out to you. So that's a little thing you can do on those pink comment cards or con connection cards. And I know there's a little bit of confusion. A couple little versions went out, but the budget remained the same, okay? So if you didn't receive it, we have copies out in the narthex. Please pick one up because we want you to be informed about where we're at. But this budget is what we rely on basically to help guide our ministries uh, throughout the years. It's generous. It's challenging in some ways. But it's also at, at its heart an educated guess. All right? It's educated in the way that we do have history. We have trends that we look at. We see what's, what's moving here and there. And the pledges which are important, All right? It's like our own checkbooks. If we know how much is going in, we know how much we can spend out. The pledges are a part of this process, that we need to know what's coming in, and it's a weekly process. Again, many of us sometimes will be giving when we're here, and if we're only here once a month, that we count on those pledges weekly. So there is a little discontinuation piece, but nonetheless. All right. In a church budgeting system, though, we primarily, as you know, rely on the giving of those who are here in our worship community. But it's still an economic-based approach. You still can't spend more than you got coming in, right? So we do have to lift that part up. But it's always a moving target. People come and go, move and, and, and things happen. We have to adjust and do those kind of things. But it's a target that we're all working on together. And so each according to their own gifts. So I'm only going to highlight a couple of things that have happened on this budget, which I encourage you, to, again, to take some time next week. We're going to have Q&As after each worship service uh, just to ask questions. If you haven't really dug into the budget before, this is what we work on together. All right? So we want, you, we want to be as open and transparent as possible because this is us in community together. So here's what I do want to highlight. Here's where you and I can make the biggest difference. If you're looking up here, last year's budget was 1.64. We're projecting through the end of this year to be right at 1 million. So already in itself, we're down one, you know, $162,000 from our projections last year. I like big whole numbers. It's about a 15% decrease in what we were expecting. All right? Happens. It's a transition. We're still working that. So all we did is take what we were projecting, and we reduced that by 1%, and that's how we got that number, 993,888. All right? It feels responsible. We know, you know we're projecting. Again, we're projecting this is what's going to happen on our weekly giving. But if we maintain the status quo and we continue to just get what we were, we're doing, we're going to end up meeting that number of 993, and we're still going to end up with that bottom right-hand number there a deficit of $70,000. We are presenting you a deficit budget this year. It's kind of where we're at, <laughs> right? We've talked it through with the executive team, with the, with the uh, finance team, parish planning. We're comfortable presenting this to you. We don't like it, but this is where we're at. Now, this number seems large, this $70,000 number, right? And in the big picture, it is. I mean, it's a, it's a good chunk of change. But here's where the power of community can overwhelm that number even. All right. If we do the math as a community and we all work together, here's the impact. You take that $70,000 on the next screen as soon as it pops up. 
This is going to be really awkward if I have to do this on my own. Do we not have that one? There we go. Okay. All right. So if we take this 70, and I'm going to round it up, so I like big whole numbers. $70,000 divided by 500 people, 500 worship units, families that are here. That's a kind of also another number. We have a few more than that. But the big picture is we have these 500 families that are here. So if we do this math, it comes out to about $140 per family. If you divide that by 52 weeks, which is the variable here, not tw- if you come once a month, we still are counting on a 52-week piece, it's about $2.70 a week, right? So instead of the venti venti at, at Starbucks, you're getting maybe the small one because <laughs> there's about a $270 increase, right? Don't pay that much for a cup of coffee, by the way. <laughs> Please don't ever do that. All right. But that's what we're talking about, $2.70 a week. Might be doable. But what happens, though, if we look even beyond that? That gets us caught up on that number, all right, if we just do that alone on top of the, the giving we're looking at. What if we did $5 a week, all right? It's harder for some than others. I get it. But what if we did that? Once again, we're going to look at the power of numbers, and each of us is contributing in a small amount, but if we're all doing it together... This is what it'll be. And again, this is the key that happens every week. So we take that $5, we multiply it by, 20, by 500, and it gives us 2,500. You all up here are like, wait, I'm in the sermon. I don't want to do math, but too bad. We're doing it. Um, $2,500 times 52 weeks is $130,000, which not only brings up our $70,000, but it gives us another 60 to do for ministry. All right? This is where the power of community works. If we had to take care of the 70000 on our own, we couldn't do it. But if we can do 250 $3 on our own, it can all be done. All right? Does that kind of, I hope that makes sense. Because there is power in all of us doing this together. And of course, we're going to have numerous ways to contribute. Personally, I kind of set it and forget it. I'll share with you that I get paid every two weeks, and by the way, and there's my cut goes right to the church, so to speak, right? My offering. And then we have additional more that throughout the weeks that we can give to other ministries that need help and those kind of things. But it's a budgeting process, and we put that in there as part of that. So I have it taken directly out. Um, we're going to have in the next couple of weeks any possible way that we can donate or give to the church, we're going to have it available. So if you do online giving, that's already there. But if you can text and give, we're going to have that, maybe through Verizon, I don't know. But we're going to have Zelle, we're going to have PayPal, we're going to have Venmo, Bill Pay, I don't know, whatever else crazy things are coming out. We're working on having everything available so that we're able to do this. So whatever way you feel led to give to God, we're going to have that opportunity. We're probably going to put kiosks out in there. Not ATMs, but kiosks. <laughs> I've, the ATM thing got shot down, <laughs> just so you know. I'm asking. I'm, I'm thinking outside the box and everything. But the bottom line is we're taking these next steps for Trinity and for the kingdom of God because as it stands right now, our, our current proposed budget, we've done our due diligence, and we've evaluated our ministries and, and made, made uh, some adjustments in staff. And so this is really where we're at, where we feel comfortable that we can continue to provide ministries going forward. But we have looked at positions. We're going to continue to look at that. What is making the biggest impact for the kingdom of God? Not for Trinity, but for the kingdom of God. And so here's an example. One of the key evaluations was our Saturday service. And I shared it with them last night, and they weren't too happy, but it is what it is. It was a very hard decision to make. But starting in January, we are going to discontinue the Saturday night service. We have overhead costs. We have some salary pieces. I mean, it's a way to kind of help stewardship-wise to kind of reduce that, as it's currently done right now every week. We are going to re-envision it, though. We're going to do it on the second Saturday of every month. We're still going to have a Saturday worship service, but we're going to wrap it around maybe a meal or we'll wrap it around an event or, you know, it'll it'll fall on Holy Saturday during Easter, so we'll be able to do, you know, a a nice Easter service. There's a lot of ways we can re-envision what, is currently going on. And that's really kind of what we're talking about. So that's going to happen in, in there. And then when you do dig into the budget, you'll also notice there's not a second line for a, an a second pastor or an associate pastor. Right? We've had an open, <laughs> open call process for the last year. Because of our denomination and some other variables, there's just not a lot of candidates out there. So what does that look like for our ministries, right? It's me. I'm okay with that. But this now becomes an all ministry type event, right? We've shifted some people around. Reese, as you know, has made her way over to the heart ministry and is doing a lot of pastoral care and and those kind of pieces. We have a great support staff through heart ministries, through our our visitation teams, which are going to continue to visit folks in in those kind of things, in hospitals and the like. But we also have a staff of Stephen ministers 
that yes, they, they, we talk to them. They're cha- we're going to challenge them to do more walking with each other as well. We're going to open up another class or two and have, if you're interested in walking with others, being a Stephen minister. All right? And what's exciting about this model, not that you know, it's only one pastor. It's not, not the exciting part, trust me. But it's a lay-driven model. It is all of us doing ministry together. It's first century. It's Acts 2. All right? Acts, Old Testament, New Testament. <laughs> There you are, New Testament, all right? Acts 2, where the community was gathered together. They were breaking bread. They were walking with one another, helping each other out. This is the community model we're talking about, really. It puts a little more burden on, on us sitting here, but this is a great model to work with, right? And I'll be honest, I've always struggled with the pastor is the only one who visits the sick model, right? If we have friends and that, we, we call them out. It's our call to walk with each other. Yes, there's specific pastoral expectations. We get that. But this is all of us together working together. It's us distributing. It's us giving them something. It's us being the hands and feet of Jesus to one another and fully participating in the kingdom of God. So those are just a couple of adjustments that we're making um, in the stewardship journey. But the goal and the vision is to bring people to Jesus Christ, to make disciples, to multiply, right? to push the kingdom of God into people's lives of others so they can experience what the joy of living with the Savior is all about. All right? All right, still with me? All right? Okay, because we're wrapping it up. It's warm in here, too. All right, verse 42. They all ate and they were satisfied. This part I really love. They are all satisfied. Um, Understand that because the disciples participated in what Jesus was doing, because they joined him in this, in this miracle and in, in doing this, all were filled. All, right? all were satisfied. When we allow God to work and participate and we're obedient to him, then everyone will be satisfied. And not just our American, uh, I guess I've had enough, kind of satisfied, right? The English definition doesn't do justice to it. The word we're talking about is the Greek word kortazo. It means to feed, to fatten, and to fill, right? It's so much bigger and broader than, oh, yeah, I'm satisfied. It's great, right? And so to be satisfied in Jesus means that there will be an abundance, right? A fattened and feeding filling. An abundance. It doesn't mean we're going to be rich, but it means that we will have enough. And we will have more than enough of what we need. And in this case of this miracle, there was more than enough. There was an abundance. And so on the heels of that satisfying abundance, Jesus has the disciples also participating again as well, as we hear in 43. The disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces of bread and fish. They did that work, right? This is awesome stuff. I kind of get excited about talking about stewardship, maybe more so than others. I get it. But this is Jesus we're talking about, folks. And Jesus is challenging us to do something with our faith, right? And so here we go. We wrap this up. Yay! All right, verse 44. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. All right, that's where we get the feeding of the 5,000. Here's how this relates to our ministries at Trinity. In this analogy, I want us to look at Trinity or the 500 families as those 5,000, right? The number we use is, is that. It's, that's what we are as a part of this community. But we can't just look at our budget in light of those 500 families, all right? Because God is bigger than that. God is bigger than this story. Here's where this gets exponentially more important for the kingdom of God. Maybe you didn't know, but you're going to know now, only men were counted in the old days, in the ancient days. Only men counted. Women and children did not count. They were property, all right? So praise God that doesn't happen anymore, (laughs) and we really are sorry that it did. But that's where that 5,000 number came from. Only the men were counted, okay? So what does that mean to us? How many of you think that it was just men that were there, right? There were women and children there as well. So when we look at this as our budget piece, this budget is bigger than just, this, just Trinity. Yes, we count our 500, but we also use this budget as a way to impact others that are not named in that 500 or those 5,000, right? This is about the kingdom of God. And as such, we have to fully understand that even when we put this budget together based on our projections and your pledges and all of those things, we can't just limit that to us. We have to allow God to work and multiply what we are doing. So when you do fill out your pledge card, which we will, know that it's going to be used for the kingdom of God, and it will be multiplied beyond what we are doing here. Those 5,000 men, I've read in many scholarship circles, represented about a two-to-one ratio. 
meaning for every man that was counted, there was at least two others that were there, women and children alike. So that number probably was and is probably closer to 15,000, right? That's Aberdeen. They have about 16,000, right? That is what we're talking about. So this kingdom approach really may sound completely countercultural to what we've always done in our church circles. And it actually feels weird for me to kind of say, too, because before my time as a pastor, I, was, I worked in, in food service in the business sector, ran $30, $40 million budgets for Panera and Cozy and other restaurants. And so this actually kind of feels a little irresponsible for me to say, but I'm not worried about that $70,000 deficit. Just not worried about it. All right? Numbers of people are going, no. <laughs> Jude's like, stop. All right? And why am I not worried about this? All right? Because I know that God's leading us. And I know that God is always working behind the scenes. And so if I can't stand up here and say that God has got his hand on this and has control of this, then what's the point, All right? Yes, we have to participate. We have to do our due diligence and give what we can give. But Jesus is leading the way, and God is faithful. God is always faithful, always has been. So we can't just limit ourselves to numbers on a paper, All right? We do use them as a guideline, yes. But if our giving goes down another 15% like it did this year, then we're still taking the fearful approach to our finances, and I promise you we're going to reap what we sow. But we are the 5,000. We can count on what we've been giving, but we cannot limit it to just those who are only there, who are only counted. Others are impacted by what we do. Right? And my friends, we get to participate in what God is doing today. We're encouraged to participate. We're commanded to participate in these miracles in the kingdom of God because all that we are and all that we have has been given to us by God, and we are to use this for his glory. And all of God's people say, amen. Let's stand as we pray. Stretch it out. Gracious God, thank you for this opportunity that we get to, to worship you, to walk with you. We ask that you take us deeper, deeper in our financial commitments, deeper in our holistic approach to our stewardship, deeper in our discipleship journey. We want to go deeper with you, and so as we lift up where we are and where we want to go, we know that only you can take us there. We get to participate, but you are the one who does the miracle. So as we, can walk, walk, as we walk with you and you walk with us, we open our hearts and sing to you. And all that we do belongs to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing this out. I have decided. I have decided. I called out his name. I'm following Jesus now, and he knows the way. And I made up my mind. I'll leave it behind. No turning back. No turning back. And I made up my mind And I'll leave it behind No turning back No turning back I'm moving on Not looking back I'm giving him All that I have No turning back No turning back You wanna come with me Wanna come with me Just loves you the same you the same. Oh, won't you come with me? Oh, won't you come with me? Just call out his name. Just call out his name. I have. 
And I have decided, I have decided to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus. Say I have decided, I have decided. I'm following Jesus, following Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I'm moving on, not looking back. I'm giving Him all that I have. No turning. And now with the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Father God, we thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior through his sacrificial death. We praise you that by his resurrection life, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him to rule as our King. As the ruler of all, we know that everything we have and all that we are belong to you, Lord. Help us to be faithful with what we have been given and encourage us to give of ourselves, our abilities, our resources, and our faith. Multiply our gifts so that you might use them to bless others, and multiply our faith so that we may take the next steps to fuller dependence upon your providential grace, which will never fail us. Lord, we continue to pray for your church, here in this house of worship and in every meeting space where believers gather in your name. Continue to shape us into one body, with Christ as the head. As his hands and feet send us out to proclaim freedom to the captives, healing to the afflicted, peace to the troubled, and hope to the suffering. May all who hear your message draw near to you in repentance and faith and find fulfillment. Gracious God, we also want to lift up all of our servicemen and women, as well as our police officers, firefighters, EMTs, and first responders. Continue to keep them safe, especially with the busyness of the upcoming holidays. As we all focus on spending time with our families, grant them protection so that they may come home safely to theirs. Now, mighty healer, we also lift up the names of all those listed in our bulletin and on our prayer chains. We especially pray for Roy Krebs, for Bob Bischoff and Pat Saunders, for Mark Franker, Del Birch, Donna Hostetler, for Jerry and Ruth Anderson, Bonnie Sharness, Echo Griffin, Noah Hazen, Jaden Gardner and Barry Jester, Denny Knoll and Glenn Beekler, Glenn Hankey, Ann Rule, Irene Pegg, and all those whose names we now mention either silently or out loud before you. As we come before your table today, Lord, we are reminded and we are thankful for your merciful rule. You reign with all glory and power and wisdom, yet you deal graciously with us, even giving us your own Holy Spirit so that we may have the faith to claim you as our King. Yet still, we wander away from your care, and we deliver ourselves over to the rule of the enemy in our lives. Lord, help us to see our sin for what it is. It is treason and rebellion. Forgive us, Lord. Have mercy on us and be patient with us according to your steadfast love. And so, with repentant hearts, we turn from our rebellion and we confess our sins to you now with a moment of silence. We confess all these things, trusting in the mercy of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now, friends, Almighty God, who freely pardons those who repent and turn to Him, now fulfill in every contrite heart the promise of redeeming grace, forgiving all our sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your friends, in the night in which He was betrayed, our Lord and Savior Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it and He gave it to His disciples and He said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And together we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come.
The feast is ready. Please come and eat. I invite you to be seated. In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory to a grave
stand. Now, having been fed, may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen us all and keep us forever in his grace to everlasting life. Amen. Now, may the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the God of all grace Bless you now and forever. Amen. Let's sing this out. Heaven thundered and the world was born. Here we go. Heaven thundered and the world was born. Life begins and ends in the dust you fall. Faith commanded and the mountains moved. Fear is losing ground to our hope in you. Here we go. Unstoppable God, let your glory go. Nothing shall be impossible. 
your kingdom reigns unstoppable. Let's sing. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Sing. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Sing. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall Now let's go in peace and serve our King. Thanks for watching. Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church can be found at 1100 Philadelphia Road in Joppa, Maryland, and at trinityjoppa.org. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. Be sure to check out the Facebook page for our Trinity Joppa YouTube channel, and please consider supporting our Patreon at patreon.com/trinityjoppa. God bless.